In this video, it's my pleasure to be interviewing Bill Riles. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy this video. Please like and subscribe and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. My book, Backgammon Backgame Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description. Uh, to everyone that's watching, everyone knows my friend Bill Riles. Welcome. Hey, Alex. How are you today? Thanks Very for good. having Thank me. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? Very well. We're uh, kind of uh, relaxing in Houston uh, for a while after so much traveling in the last few months. So uh, Yes, yes. Uh, you're, you're there. Uh, I saw Tara walking around, and that's your dog, Guinness, right? Mr. Guinness here, he likes to, uh, you know, occasionally we'll have Zoom calls of one sort or another. And, and for whatever reason, he always ends up wanting to be in my lap. So, <laughs> well, that's fun. How long have you had uh, Guinness? Yeah. So, how long I'm have sorry? you had your dog Guinness? Guinness, he's six. And we, uh, we've had him about five years. He's six and a half. We've had him five and a half years. Great. We, uh, he was a, a, how shall we say, a pick of the litter of a, a woman that uh, had a private breeding uh, operation for dachshunds, and she had kept him because she, she thought he was so cute, and he was kind of the run of the litter that he came out of. So he wasn't, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> he wasn't uh, a breeding specimen, you know. So she kept him as a pet, and then. Uh, ultimately decided to go another direction with other uh, types of dogs and and we got him so right it's a man's <laughs> best friend uh, all right well we're happy to have you uh we'll talk a, a lot about back him and i'd like to start a little bit about with some uh biographical information if i may please share with us uh where you were born and raised where you were educated where you live i know you're in houston now and whether you're married you have kids day job all that stuff please well i was born in uh, beaumont texas which is over in the far southeast uh, corner of the state of texas mm -hmm. i went to high school in beaumont and then uh went to uh, rice university in houston for undergraduate and graduate program had a uh, actual degrees in structural engineering. And I worked for, I don't know, 30 years plus in the offshore oil and gas business, designing platforms and managing their construction and fabrication installation. And, uh, you know, enjoyed it. I have lived in Houston ever since I started to rice. Uh, so longer than we would like to think perhaps, <laughs> but, <laughs> I have uh, three adult children, and Tar and I have been together eight years now. Again, how time flies when you're having a great time. Yeah. And uh, again, we live in Houston, up on the northwest uh, side of the city, next to uh, a very famous uh, uh, country club, golf course, Champions Golf Club, which uh, actually hosted the uh, Tour Championship for a number of years and hosted the... Uh, the U S open once or twice. So it's, uh, we don't live on the course, but nearby the course. That's great. And I know you're a big sports fan yourself, aren't you? Yes. I, I follow all sports. I used to, you know, I played sports all my life pretty much. Um, kind of getting past that age now, I guess where <laughs> it catches up with us, but I, I do, uh, I don't watch as many sports as I used to, but I do follow sports. Yeah. And you said you had three adult children. Do you have any grandchildren? I have one granddaughter. Yeah. How she's, old is she? Uh, she's six. Oh, that's great. Uh, someone told me this joke one time. Uh, man said, I realize grandchildren are better than children. If I had known that, I would have had them first. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, you're not stuck with them continuously, perhaps like you are with the kids. I know. Uh, I have two children, so it's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. I had uh, a daughter, and then uh, when she was hmm, 23 months old, we had twin boys. So we had three under two, in effect. So uh, wow, that'll that'll keep you busy. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think at least when they're that age, sometimes they play with each other. Sometimes they fight. Yeah, and that's that's true. I mean, the you know, the daughter was two years older, so she always played mom to the kids, and <laughs> to the boys, and the boys could always pretty much play with each other. And uh, so it, it worked out fine. That's good. So now you're you're retired from from your job that you were talking about. Yeah, I retired relatively early in life, I guess. Uh, not that I was wealthy or anything, but I was comfortable. And, um, you know, you see people, uh, so many people, and we all have these in our, you know, realms of, of friends and what have you, you know, some people work till they're 65 or 70 and and retire and drop over the next day, you know, and, and some people, uh, you know, like to enjoy life more. And it's like, you know, it's had the old adage. What was it? Uh, you can work to work to live or live to work. And, uh, so I chose to, to retire when I was what, 52, something like that. And, uh, it's worked out great. Yeah. And now you enjoy your time with backgammon and other things. Yeah, Tar and I have been, uh, well, we're pretty much consumed with backgammon in many regards, but uh, fortunately, um, you know, we get to travel all over the states and all over the world with backgammon, and um, yeah, it's a great way to see the world, and it, it's a great community of people, and we, uh, you know, we know and are known by pretty much all of the backgammon players in the world. And, uh, and that's a blast. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is great. I, I really enjoy watching your videos and so many of my viewers as well. Uh, so how did you first get into backgammon? Well, when I <clears throat> got out of the, uh, got out of university, I started work with uh, a company called Brown and Root, which was a large engineering and construction firm in Houston, very large. And they had a number of, uh, engineers that were middle eastern heritage uh, and these guys would be playing this game at, at lunch you know and other groups were playing bridge and and different things but i kind of gravitated to these guys playing this uh this board game uh and again like many i guess i had seen the the board on the back of chess boards and and this that and the other but i didn't really have an appreciation for it but i started uh watching those guys and ultimately got included in the game and you know, it went from there and that was back, you know, mid to late seventies. So that was kind of the real boom era of uh backgammon in the States at least. So, uh, you know, there were backgammon tables in every restaurant and bar in the city. Uh, there was a Texas backgammon association, which had, uh, you know, tournaments, which had two or 300 people every month that rotated between Houston, Dallas, and Austin. So it was a pretty active scene at the time. Yeah. I heard back in, in those times, it was, it was really much more popular than it is now. Well, it was, and, and, and in certain regards, it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, that was obviously pre-bot days and things of that nature. So, um, everyone thought they were as good as anybody else. So, <laughs> you know, so a lot of people played, a lot of people would play, you know, each other for money perhaps or whatever. And, uh, you know, somebody could continually maybe clean up on someone and that someone thinks that, boy, this guy's the luckiest guy on the planet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, then that, uh, you know, the game kind of, uh, regressed a bit whatever for 20 years or so i guess and now um you know it's beginning to come back somewhat i think right right do you do you happen to remember any of the top players from back then well again i i didn't uh i was playing in texas yeah uh people like sandy lebetkin who was a uh, a big name in those days and, and Sandy's still playing here in Houston. Um, you know, would run into Malcolm Davis occasionally, um, Tom Wheeler from Dallas, um, various ones of that nature. There was a, a gentleman who was a, um, uh, 
mechanical engineering professor at the University of Houston named Gus Michalopoulos, who apparently played fairly widely, but, and he had grown up in Greece, I guess, and had grown up playing and he was just would get so frustrated with the game because he thought he was the world's best player. And he was a very good player and he, he just could not stand losing, you know, and, and ultimately he just quit the game and uh, walked away from it. And, you know, everyone, um, in various fashions has to cross that bridge <laughs> and you, uh, you, you know, you learn to live with the, the wins as well as the losses, the bad beats, as well as the good, the good wins. And, uh, you move on, you know, if you, uh, if you let it get the best of you, it will. That's true. That's true. I did, uh, have the pleasure of meeting Malcolm Davis a few times. He was quite the player and also quite the gentleman. Yeah, he was a unbelievable guy. He and I were quite good friends. Um, you know, it was really uh, painful to lose him three years ago. And, um, you know, I have so many great Malcolm stories. It, uh, You know, it, like our tournament that we run here in Texas, Texas Baggaman Championships, we started in 2013. And Malcolm won the first tournament which was the the first major tournament that had been played in Texas in 20 years or something at that time. And Malcolm won the first event. Well, we also have our master's event is called the, uh, the Longhorn Classic, and it has a bronze figurine Texas Longhorn as a trophy. Well, Malcolm went to the University of Texas, which the mascot is Longhorn. And, you know, if you, you may or may not remember this, but, at every backgammon tournament he ever went to, pretty much, he wore a, a Texas Longhorn baseball cap. He had a Texas that was orange, you know, for Texas. Had a Longhorn head on the, you know, on the cap. And he got to the, he never won it. He got to the final. He lost once in the final. And it was interesting because, uh, you know, being a fellow Texan, and as he was getting increasingly older and a bit more frail and and what have you, you know, several people were suggesting, well, you ought to give Malcolm a Longhorn trophy, you know, a figurine. And, and being a fellow Texan, I, I knew Malcolm. I said, Malcolm doesn't want me to give him a Longhorn trophy, right? If he'd, he'd love to win it and earn it, but he's not going to take it, you know, if he doesn't earn it. So what we did, and while he was still alive and in his presence one time, we, we now call it the Malcolm Davis Longhorn Classic, and it has its name on the trophy. So he was able to see that some. So he's, uh, you know, he's remembered in that way. And, uh, you know, and it's even funny, this, this past year, his grandson, who I'd never met, uh, called me up, and uh, he wanted to give us uh, the tournament. This was at Malcolm's request, I guess, in the state and whatever he gave us the tro the tournament a number of malcolm davis's own boards wow. so we're going to um starting this year we have a just absolutely jim mint original aries board that's the the green and gold board which was one of the more popular and and more rare color combinations so uh, henceforth we're going to play the masters final on malcolm davis's own board so very appropriate so that's uh, that's kind of neat, we think. Yeah, he was outstanding. I I also remember he was uh, always a student of the game. I would see him. He was one of the first person, first people I met who would videotape every match. This was before we had all the equipment that you had, that you have. Um, but he would do that all the time. Yeah, he was. Uh, you know, he, he was doing that. Like you say, he was perhaps one of the very first to, to record his matches. And, uh, you know, there's always some great stories along that line. You'd mentioned Malcolm being a gentleman and, uh, two that come to mind really quickly. He was playing in Peoria 15, 18 years ago. And, <laughs> you know, he's one of the best players in the States, one of the best players in the world. And he, uh, he entered the, uh, the main event lost the first round to an unknown without scoring a point. 
lost in consolation to another unknown without scoring a point, lost in the last chance to a third unknown without scoring a point. So he, he went over three in Peoria without scoring a point. And then there was another guy, and, and you know him, I'm not going to call a name, but Malcolm was playing a, a gentleman in the, in the final. Uh, maybe it was Peoria, maybe it was Chicago, up in the Midwest. And uh, Malcolm was huge favorite in this match, and he was just – the other guy was just rolling like crazy. And the other guy was a competent player, but he was getting everything, and he's just – destroying Malcolm you know maybe they're playing to 13 and it's 11 to nothing and finally you know Malcolm has to leave like a triple shot and there's something and this guy rolls and misses it and he just kind of goes the opponent goes oh man I can't believe it you know <laughs> and Malcolm you know he he never if people who played him he never he just looked at the board he didn't look around he didn't look but in that case, he looked, just kind of cut his eyes up at the guy and said, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> just looks right back down and goes on playing. So uh, he was a great guy. Yeah, people people remember their bad luck more than their good luck. <laughs> so I remember, um, I believe the first time I met you must have been around 2009 or 2010. I was at the Las Vegas tournament and there was – a group of guys, we all went to the Peppermill restaurant. You remember that restaurant? Yeah, and in fact, we, was it this year, Tyre? We went to the, a year ago, maybe, I don't know. We went to the Peppermill, uh, <laughs> and it, it's still there. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, it's funny because uh, we have a, would have developed into some, some good friends and you'll recognize one of the names, this young girl that's played at Texas and then played in Chicago does some commentary with me on occasion named Hannah DeRossier from Lake yeah. Charles, Louisiana. They were in Vegas in whenever the last term was September. And they were asking, uh, you know, things to do, where do we need to go eat? And I said, well, you really need to go over to the pepper mill for, for breakfast. That's a tradition, you know? And they come back and they're like, Oh my God, you know, we could have gotten by with one plate, you know, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it was amazing. I yeah. always remember, you know, like you said, the groups always used to go over from the Riviera to the, to the pepper mill. Right. And, uh, you know, everybody Carter and all that bunch stick, I think ate every yeah. meal at the pepper mill. <laughs> it couldn't have been the food. I think maybe it was the waitresses, but, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that was uh, within walking distance of the Riviera, right? Oh, it was just across the street, yeah. across a side street. It was on the same side of the uh, of the strip, but just like a block over from um, right. from the Riviera. So it was extremely convenient. Yeah, yeah, and I understand it's no longer twenty four hours. That's right. You know, it, it was funny again back in I guess in we we were in April in Vegas and then in September in Vegas and Vegas is not like you remember. And, and maybe it's not, uh, you know, maybe this started as a result of the pandemic and so forth, but, uh, you know, it used to be Vegas, everything in Vegas was 24 seven pretty much, you know? Right. And, and now that's not the case. Pepper mill closes at 11, you know, well, the evening's just getting going as far as Vegas goes. <laughs> and even in, you know, some of the, uh, I know this, the hotel that, uh, the most recent Vegas tournaments were in the Westgate, which was a very nice facility. They had some very nice restaurants, but the restaurants were only open from like six to 10 even every evening. And that's it. And, wow. uh, you know, and as a result of being open such short hours, they were always booked. It was very difficult to get a table. So, uh, I don't know. It's, it's an unusual, uh, city in comparison to what it used to be. And I hear the Westgate is famous for its uh, weightlifting competition. <laughs> that was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and that ballroom next door to us uh, here in September, there was this uh, powerlifting competition with a, you know, a DJ and bump music to get them fired up, I guess, or whatever. And it was it was loud, <laughs> you know. And and maybe you heard the story after the fact you know, and we had live streamed all of these matches and 
all of this noise. Tara was uploading some of the YouTube videos from the live streams, and she actually got flagged by YouTube <laughs> with some potential copyright violations from music that was being being played next door. <laughs> My <know>? goodness. <laughs> So it was, it was, it was loud. I could hear it when I was watching the live stream. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, back in those days, I remember you were playing in all the tournaments. When did you start getting involved in directing tournaments and doing all the video that you're currently doing? Well, I started playing like an ABT events and this, that, and the other in maybe 2004, 2005. And, um, then Tara and I had been friends online for a long time with Ace Point, um, an online service that she had at that time for like 10 years or something. And then we, uh, you know, I guess in 2011, 12 or something like that, we started talking about having a tournament in Texas and hosting it ourselves. And, uh, you know, she was living in San Antonio. I was living in Houston and she, uh, you know, San Antonio is, it's a big city, but it's a very concentrated city with just one central business district more. So big convention city, big tourist city, and everything's right downtown. You know, the river walk, the Alamo, the Pearl district, just everything is right there. Yes, so, I visited um, San Antonio one time, and I remember just that. Oh, it's it's amazing. And uh, so we decided that, you know, we wanted to make our tournament a destination tournament where there was a lot more to do than, than just backgammon, and people could go and, uh, you know, do other things and see other things. And so we decided to go to San Antonio, and and it's, it's paid off in spades for us. We've been uh, very well supported. Uh, people love the city. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's worked out great. And again, we're unique in the, in the States, ABT to, uh, to be the only downtown location. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the other tournaments for the most part, and, and I understand the reasons and this, that, and the other, but almost all of them are at airport hotels. And those are typically, you know, well removed from the city centers or, the main attractions of the cities or what have you. And, you know, we're, we're right downtown in a historic, traditional, very beautiful uh, renovated hotel. You know, all the fine restaurants are out just steps down the street. Uh, it's, it's really a neat city. Yeah. I, I know that I traditionally uh, a lot of the tournaments have had the, the venues at a hotel near the airport, because that made it easier for people to get to when they're traveling from out of town. However, nowadays with all the tra transportation with uh, not just taxis, but Uber and Lyft and things like that, people get to everywhere really fast. And I actually did a survey one time asking people about um, tournaments and what they like. And some people, a lot of people actually said they like it to be in a location where there are things to do outside of the hotel. Exactly. And that's, you know, and, and I've given up trying to talk to people about it, I guess, and that, um, you know, the, the convenience of an airport hotel that people assign a lot of directors assign a lot of, uh, priority to, or advantage to, or something <clears throat> is not that big a deal. Uh, like you say, people, people can get around, people can want to see places, see the city. Now, you know, oftentimes there's a, maybe a financial advantage to having it at airport hotels because airport hotels are typically not as busy on the weekend. You know, they're, they serve as business travelers during the week and perhaps they can get better, better room rates, better ballroom rates and this, that, and the other. And I understand that. I mean, nobody's getting rich uh, directing backgammon tournaments or hosting backgammon tournaments. And, uh, but, you know, we like to play upon that, uniqueness of our own and and we've been very successful in in doing so yeah yeah i think you guys have just been doing an outstanding job texas is like 
the most uh, the most well attended in the United States or at the top somewhere. Well, it was New York bigger as a whole, but Texas this year was the largest championship division, the largest masters division. So we don't have, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, there are very few backgammon players in San Antonio, no. whereas you contrast that with New York or Chicago or LA uh, where, you know, they have a pretty large playing population of their own. Well, if you're going to the Texas backgammon championships, pretty much you're from out of town, right? So, so, um, you know, where a lot of these, uh, tournaments, you know, all the tournaments we're familiar with on the ABT tour, you know, maybe they have a hundred room nights or 200 room nights or which is the measure by which, uh, hotels gauge events and this, that, and the other. Well, we have over 500 room nights in Texas wow. because, uh, I mean, we just blow everybody else away because we have, um, you know, it's a big tournament and everyone pretty much that attends is from out of town. So, uh, you know, that it's kind of a, the dynamics of various tournaments and what have you are interesting and, you know, and that's, uh, that's an interesting aspect of uh, of our tournament. That that's that, that's very interesting. One of my personal goals is to try to increase attendance at these tournaments. I don't know if you ask people, but if you do ask people, what do they say are the reasons that they like to come to San Antonio as compared to other places? Several factors, I think. One, uh, as we've been talking about, the location, the the downtown location i know this this past february it was really neat there was a big uh the majestic theater is right across the street it's a big um uh, you know for shows and musicals and things of that nature and there was a big show going on during our tournament and every night you can look out from the terrace next to our playing area and the streets are filled with people and cars and it's just it's a like a a bustling downtown area, you know, and that's so completely different than, you know, an airport hotel where there's nothing anywhere near you, you know? And, right. um, so people like that. And it's, uh, you know, another thing about it too, is the, you know, we're in February in South Texas, the, uh, the weather is, uh, moderate. Uh, it might be in the seventies, um, uh, it's not going to be in the thirties, you know, it's, so it's, it's really nice weather, really nice restaurants. It, it's funny. There's a, a restaurant next door to the Gunter hotel where we have the tournament now called Bohannon's and, uh, just a superb restaurant. And one gentleman that you, you know, uh, probably fairly well, Robert Stoller, who's, uh, kind of like USB Jeff historian and really great guy, a good friend of mine. And he's traveled the world, certainly traveled all over the States. And he says, as far as he's concerned, uh, Bohannon's is the, uh, you know, one of the top five restaurants in the United States. And every year we have people, you know, even before they come to the tournament, they have their reservations at Bohannon's. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting dynamic. Yeah, that's great. I have I have the website up with the Texas Backgammon Championships. I'll put a link in here. Is there a link from here to the tournament? Well, is that is the oh. tournament website. Ah, okay. And, there we go. From there, as you can see at the top, there's uh, links to the brochure to register for the tournament, to make a hotel registration. Yeah. Um, pretty much all inclusive. Uh, you can do it all from the website itself. One and as you can days. see there, we, yeah. uh, we do the UBC USA tournament, which right. is, uh, working with galaxy on their UBC format. And this will be the third year that we, we've, we've done that. And it's kind of interesting in that, uh, every match in the UBC is, is live streamed. So this year we'll be running five live streams. So we'll have a maximum of 20 players in a UBC but those matches are transcribed live transcribed from the feeds by some, uh, some gentlemen in Europe. And so by the time those matches are finished within 10 minutes, we have the results of PR wow. results so we can keep everything updated and, 
and so forth. So it's just amazing that, uh, you know, again, five live streams and that uh, picture right there is pretty neat. And one of my favorite things to visit is the San, uh, San Fernando, San Fernando cathedral. And they have, um, like Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights during the tournament, they have a, kind of a laser show on the front facade of the cathedral, which is kind of a historical, um, video produ uh, depiction of San Antonio. And it's really, really a neat thing to see. So, uh, it but is. you know, it's another thing. And one thing that we're going to re realize we've realized in the past, we're going to realize it more and more this year, you know, Tar and I do so much, uh, international travel and streaming and commentary and so forth. This year we were in Istanbul. We were in Monte Carlo. We were in Dubai and, you know, we meet and see and know so many people and we're going to have a considerable number of uh, international players coming to San Antonio this year. So I think uh, it'll, that'll be neat. Um, you know, and, and we love having them, love seeing them, you know, and, and it's interesting. I had watched, uh, one of your video interviews earlier today, just to kind of familiarize myself with, with what you do and, and what have you. And, uh, I, I think it was with Jason Dortle and you and he were talking about people on occasion coming up to you and saying, Oh, I recognize you or something like that. And we experienced that all the time you know it was funny in uh like in istanbul this year the tournament there's 700 people and uh the uh tars holding me notes that's okay <laughs> but uh you know 700 people in istanbul and we uh you know, we'd be walking through the hotel or through the playing room or whatever. And just, I bet it happened a hundred times where someone would walk up to me. Oh, hi, I'm, you know, I'm whatever a name is. I don't know, you know, Mohammed something, right? <laughs> Say a Turkish name of some sort. And I'm like, oh, well, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Bill Rouse. Oh, I know who you are. You know, we watch <laughs> all of your videos, you know, and they, people would want pictures with us. You know, it's yeah. just crazy. You're and you famous. get the same thing in, uh, you know, in Monte Carlo, same thing in Dubai. It was just amazing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like what makes it worthwhile too, because, uh, you know, after like the Monte Carlo final this year is an example where uh, Frank Frigo won the world championship over Mario Kuhl from Germany, who had just one of the most incredible weeks of backgammon one can imagine. But that final video within like three or four days had had 50,000 views. Yeah. And uh, now is, I, I haven't looked in the last few days, but it's probably close to 70,000 views now. And, um, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that, uh, we think grows the game. And, uh, you know, if we can, and what I love to do, doing commentary and, and I'll put a plug in for a certain match. If people want to see what we do and, and kind of, you know, appreciate it, the match, the first match this year between Victor Askenazi and Chris Rogers, which was the undefeated semifinal. Uh, I did the commentary with Sebastian Wilkinson, which yeah. who's great grandmaster from the UK. And, um, uh, that is on galaxies, bag and galaxy YouTube channel, which we stream a lot there and they're very gracious to allow us to do so. But if you go to the Monte Carlo icons for bag and galaxy, YouTube day seven stream one is the uh and the first video on that stream is uh victor and chris rogers a great match it was probably in my estimation the best stream we've ever done between the production and the appearance and whatever the match itself the commentary with me and sebastian we just had a great chemistry and whatever and 
that's worth your time to view. I think I watched that one live. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was amazing. You know, and it's interesting because, uh, and you've watched, I know you watch a lot of our streams and commentaries and so forth. You know what, and you talk about how do you make the game more attractive to a wider audience and this, that, and the other. You know, what I try to do, and, and a number of people do commentary, and everybody has their own style, and, you know, they're they're good in various respects. Uh, what I like to do is, is, you know, kind of balance it somewhat between the technical and the describing what's going on and talking about the tournament and talking about the individuals and interjecting a little humor here. That I want to make it more watchable yeah. so that, you know, you know, it's one thing for – alex or somebody else to watch one of the, the streams and you know if it's just nothing but dry analysis of the positions and so forth you get it right but the vast majority of the people who might want to you know check out a little bit of this they're not going to get it it's just going to blow right by them so we um you know i try to balance it and make it more watchable and um you know we've had a lot of success at it and we you know it's interesting I mean, it's like, you know, once people are dropping out of the tournament and all, I mean, we'll have people fighting over the seats to do commentary, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah. players, they love to do it. And, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, have you got somebody lined up for such and such match? I said, yeah, well, you know, Steve has already said he wants to do that. Well, can I do one after that? You know, and it's just, it's amazing. And, you know, and it's, it's really neat because you get a chance to, to kind of through the media medium of streaming, you get to get to know some of these players, their personalities, you, uh, you know, get a feeling for their perspective on the game, how they think about things. Um, you know, some of them are much better than others at it, you know, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun and people enjoy doing it. And, uh, I think it's a great way to, uh, you know, grow the game, uh, introduce, uh, you know, personalities and players to the, to the general audience. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we've, we've seen it in poker. We've seen, we see it in all kinds of things, but, you know, you have to have, people have to be known. They have to be, have to have kind of stars. You have to have, you know, people that people will know who they are and can relate to. And maybe there's, you know, maybe certain people, you know, relate to Victor because he's a great player and he's a Russian immigrant to the States or whatever. And somebody right. else really likes Sebastian because he's from the UK or Mochi or Michi or Akiko from Japan. You get people from all over the world that people can identify with. And, uh, it's really neat, you know, four or five years ago in Monte Carlo, we actually had, uh, we didn't run it so much as a contest, but we kind of said, well, you know, we got a, you know, a streaming opportunity coming up. Who do y'all want to see, you know? And mm -hmm. all these people are, are watching and following the brackets. And I mean, it come back, just everybody wanted to see Mislav Kovacic from Croatia versus Ali Setin Belenay from Turkey, you know, both great players, but, uh, you know, maybe they're not as well known as they might be, but that was the match, you know, and it, it was a great match. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're, you're the one that everyone recognizes on camera, but the one who runs the show behind the scenes is Tara. We never see her. If she would like, I'd I'd love to have her <laughs> uh, join if she wants to, and make some. Well, she can come over here and, and sit down. Uh, you might have to get over here fairly close to me. You can see the I camera. I can I can see her. Right. Welcome, welcome, Tara. How are you doing? Love you. Um, I'm, I know I'm normally behind the camera. I'm always behind the camera. <laughs> but you know, it, you're right, Alex. Is, I mean, she uh, is the technical guru and 
creation guru of all the graphics and the production and so forth. And there's, and it's, it's interesting because it's all self-learned and self-taught. Right. You know, she didn't have technical training in this. It's, it's research and Googling things and studying things. And I mean, if we could pan around this room right now, this is like a, this is the den in the house. This is like a production studio. And I mean, before we go to a tournament, people don't quite realize this. I mean, for a big gig like Monte Carlo or Dubai or something, it's set up for a month in advance in this, in this den here, every, all the graphics, all the layouts, everything's done, everything's tested. Um, you know, it's, and so then we get there and, and some of these big gigs, I mean, it's a eight or 10 or 12 hour setup once we're there, but it's all, it's all been done in advance. She has on her computer wiring diagrams, right. like you used to see in radio catalogs and so forth. She has wiring diagrams where how to hook it all up. And uh, it's just amazing. I know the last, this year, February of this year, Petco came in one morning and I, I said, well, come back here over to like streaming control more or less, you know, and he steps behind us and he goes, oh man, this looks like a ESPN studio or something, you know? And I said, yeah, I mean, people can walk into the tournament in San Antonio and you see, you know, five streaming tables, a big screen TV at each table. Yeah. And then all of this equipment behind it it just blows people's minds you know yes and all of that it's our avocation we love doing it i mean we've invested a large sum of money all personal funds you know it's not subsidized in any way or sponsored or anything like that it's ours and uh you know and that's that's why we're known as we are and, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. We did the Dubai tournament this year, which was an incredible event. And two quick stories about that. Uh, Patrick Jabelli, who runs that tournament, he, he did a great marketing and promotion campaign of about the tournament and who's coming and this, that, and the other. We had a picture up promoting us streaming and commentary by Tara and Bill. And people were giving us a lot of grief because one name wonders, you know, no last name. It's just Tara and Bill and everybody <laughs> knows who it is. Right. So that, that's kind of neat. And then another thing, which will blow people's minds a bit at Dubai, we had this huge streaming setup, like we always do. Uh, but then <laughs> Patrick comes up with his brilliant brainstorm promotional deal the final is going to be played at the top of the Burj Khalifa, which is yes. the tallest building in the world. So Saturday night, early Sunday morning, we had to break everything down at the hotel venue early Sunday afternoon, take it all in like six suitcases, six traveling suitcases to the Burj Khalifa, finally get up there after all the security and everything, get it all set up, stream for a couple of three hours, and then have to take it all back down. So it's a, it's a monumental amount of work. But, yes. Uh, I saw, I saw that. And Tara, I have to congratulate you and commend you on all of your work. I believe I saw some video of your ESPN studio that you've set up. I've seen photographs <laughs> of all of your luggage uh, and I don't know, how do you, how do you do all of that? Let's get, let's give Tara a chance to tell us about it. Tara, sorry. Uh, I can't hear you from your microphone. You want to try using bills? Give me a second. Hang on a second. Hold on for that. Okay. She'll come back, but it's. She thinks it's, she turned. She turned it she off. She turned that mic off. While I, okay. There we go. That's better. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank Sorry you for about that. Um, well, basically, um, I started working with Patty Rubin, who yes. passed yes. away, who is associated, originally associated with the uh, Beckham World Championship in Monte Carlo. Um, 
It probably would have been something like my, I don't know, 13th, 14th year working with Patty if she were still alive. Um, but anyway, um, very long story. I don't want to get into that because it's it would take like way too much time for me to, uh, you know, sort of summarize. But anyway, um, I started streaming as a result of um, our not having uh, Rynell Nunez uh, available to stream our own Texas tournament. She so streamed it the first year or two. Right. And you were doing that. I didn't know that. Yes, she was. So um, Justin Nunez's lovely wife, super smart, super creative, super brilliant. And um, there wasn't anybody else. I mean, nobody was streaming anything. Nobody knew how to do anything. And um, it's not like you could just say, well, let's get so and so, you know, um, like, for example, at that time, Michelle Steinberg was brilliant doing transcription. Um, that was when uh, Bill Riles was amazing coming up with the uh, dual dual format, which was yeah. sort of the precursor of the UBC. Right. I remember that. And, uh, you know, there's no one out there. Somebody has to stream these things. And there wasn't anybody. No one, you know, there were no other options. And so I said to myself, well, I have to learn. And so it was a lot of failure, um, a whole lot of failure. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest failures was definitely at the world championship. Uh, it's, it's really good that no one <laughs> reminds me of that. But um, so anyway, after that, things definitely went on. You know, you pretty much hit bottom and you keep improving. So thank goodness that took place. Um, so anyway, uh, yes. well, when I tell years people later, this, yeah, this is where we are. Yeah. Don't don't call it a failure. Call it a learning opportunity. Oh, no, it was it was definitely a failure. It was an <laughs> embarrassment. It was horrid. Um, a lot of this actually a lot of the improvement does indeed stem from um doing uh the USBGF's prime time back in and magazine um the graphics and the learning curve are very much parallel tremendous amount of things have uh things in common so um you know it's basically streaming to me is uh the let's say video form of the magazine and so it's it's all the same. Right. Well, I have to extend my appreciation and gratitude for all of your hard work. Really enjoy all of it and definitely keep up the great work. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting too, Alex, and I alluded to earlier that, uh, you know, she's studied, researched, experimented, executed these streams for like 10 years to get to where we are today and uh it's just amazing you know what she can do and if people you know when they're at tournaments and they see our our setup it just blows their minds you know and some people uh want to uh yeah it's funny uh, you know others do streaming and i applaud them for all the streaming they do it's a lot of work but they, uh, you know, they don't have the equipment we have, and that makes it very difficult to do so. And, uh, but it, it's kind of uh, funny at times, you know, we'll have people coming back and taking pictures of all our, our equipment and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I guess they go home and, and try to replicate it. But, it, you know, it's, it's 10 years of study and experience and experimentation that, have gotten us to where we're at.
Yeah, sorry, Bill. No uh, problem. I uh, we're just closing up shop here in the office, but I'm I'm listening. I pulled up your um, YouTube channel here, um, and here it has a lot of it has been live, and this is really great. I really enjoy watching these, and I see you have them categorized. For example, the Las Vegas open several days. This is the Oasis back uh, in Dubai, which was outstanding. Chicago going down. The U.S. Open that was in Las Vegas, Atlanta, all sorts of things. And a lot of the uh, the ones from Monte Carlo were, a lot of them were on the Backgammon Galaxy. Yeah, we've moved pretty much all of those to the Backgammon Galaxy YouTube channel. We uh, typically, we have a great relationship with them. Typically, we'll stream the stream number one, which is the commentated stream on Backgammon Galaxy and the remainder of them on uh, uh, Ace Point youtube channel but we've moved all of the world championship content over to backgammon galaxy since it's kind of their event anyway right uh, and you also in addition to the streaming and commentating you run tournaments uh locally in houston and on your ace point site is that correct that's right we have a houston backgammon club we have a monthly tournament uh on a saturday mid-month that that uh, a live tournament that we run and then we have the uh, ace point bag and weekend jackpots online which uh typically every weekend that we're in town and uh, that uh, we have one of them's a hundred dollar jackpot and uh, it's one of the strongest fields typically that you will ever see <laughs> this uh this week we had uh what Victor, John O'Hagan, Gaz Owen, Chris Rogers, uh, Stefan, Nunyan, Sean Garber, Boris Dektiar. Oftentimes we'll have uh, Chris Trencher and Michael Nayagu, uh, just on and on. It's uh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I see. This is so, this is the site for that, right? Yeah, if you scroll down a little bit there, where you see Victor's name on the right on that. Now you oh, there, right here. there. You can go to that red line to the left. Click on that. This one. Yeah. And I think that'll you can yeah, there's the draw sheet of this weekend's tournament. Yeah. Tournament. So uh just uh or that was one of the free rolls in it. But nonetheless, um And you played. Look at that. Yeah, I played much to my uh sugar in. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in, jump in with the big fish sometimes, but, uh, it's a lot of fun. The guys, uh, everyone enjoys it. You know, one thing, and, and we've talked about growing the game, uh, in various ways. And, and one of the biggest things is streaming. I mean, we've had that experience with San Antonio from our very first tournament in 2013 and Rynell was doing that one but we've always heavily focused on streaming. And I think that got us so much early exposure and recognition and so forth that it's paid off in spades over the years. And that's, you know, there's other people that recognize uh, that Rory has, has been a big proponent of streaming and we always do his jobs over the last three or four years. Atlanta just exploded in growth because of the, the, the ex, I mean, Jeff and we were doing a good job, but the, the exposure from the streaming, I think paid off well as, uh, and then, uh, Patty did in, uh, in the Monte Carlo. And then of course, when she passed and Mark Olson and galaxy took it over, like, you know, and we like to think he said, you know, the first call I made, well, probably wasn't the first call he made, but one of the first calls he made, he called Tara and, and myself and said, I want y'all to do the streaming. Yeah. And, uh, so we've done that the two years that galaxy's had it. Patrick Jabelli was the same thing in Dubai this year. Um, I want y'all to do the streaming, you know, just, so it, it's been fun. And, you know, I know on your list there, you were asking some of our favorite tournaments and things of that nature. Yeah, and, uh, please tell us. And we, uh, you know, we've been to every tournament in the States and, you know, every tournament has its own personality and 
the director's personality influences the tournament somewhat and and they're all fine we we enjoy them you know obviously we're biased in thinking ours is the best because it probably you know it, it reflects us it so it's it's tara and bill's tournament you know and that's what we want to do but uh you know then you go to uh you know, some of the best tournaments we've ever attended, there was a world backgammon federation world team championship and world individual championship in Trier, Germany, Trier, Germany, two years ago. And that was just a stunning venue. It was in a museum glass and steel structure, which was built probably a hundred feet into the air over a bunch of Roman ruins. And we actually played on the, ground floor of this which was like 30 feet below street level with the walls of roman ruins all around us you're playing right there amongst them it was just stunning and then of course you know monte carlo that's got to be on everyone's bucket list it's just uh, an amazing right. event dubai this year was amazing cyprus we've been to artist tournaments um three or four times and we're not going to make it this year but and and next year, and we we certainly hope to attend, is uh, next year's Swedish Open in Stockholm, wow. which is in early July, I think. That is uh, the 2024 World Badminton Federation World Team Championship and World Individual Championship is held in conjunction with the Swedish Open, and that's just going to be phenomenal. And uh, Jorgen Grandstedt is the um, I don't know, organizer, head guy, whatever, Arda directs it. Uh, it's just going to be an unbelievable event. And it's at an, an old hotel on the waterfront, like out away from the city, but it's been completely refurbished. It's just beautiful to look at the pictures and everything. It's on the waterfront. It's kind of like a, something you'd see on, uh, I don't know, Cape Cod or Nantucket or somewhere up in the, you know, one of these old, almost colonial style looking hotels, you know, on the waterfront. And it, we're just terribly excited about that. So, uh, you know, it, uh, we love what we do. And, and I mentioned earlier, and one thing I, I, I wanted to note, we talked about Texas it's coming up in February um great staff we've got a lot of international players coming and we have a, a great international staff too we have uh jesper carlson has been working with us for i think this will be his fifth or sixth year from sweden who's one of the best director guys in the world jeff proctor's on the staff this year we're adding uh hopefully uh jason grandstadt is going to be an assistant to jesper that's uh, jorgen's son and yeah. we're also uh, bringing in, and and who knows what the geopolitical situation is, is going to be like, but we're supposed to have uh, Aviv Ziva from Israel, who's done the transcription work in uh, Monte Carlo for the last couple of years, is supposed to be in San Antonio as well. So uh, it's going to be, it, that's going to be a fun tournament. We're looking Yeah, forward. one of these days when uh, my kids get older, <laughs> No, and I have time. I'm gonna get <laughs> well, you got one that's two and a half. I don't know if, if I'll is. still be around when you're ready to travel, Alex. But <laughs> she is. She's. Uh, yeah, she's. She's. Uh, she has a lot of energy. Um, you know how it is. I know how it is. <laughs> now, uh, before we run out of time, I also wanted to talk about um, – the Ace Point Backgammon Shop, because not only do you do all the streaming and run the tournaments, but you have your own backgammon shop, like an online store. And I've gotten some things from you uh, in the past, and it's just like outstanding quality and outstanding uh, service. How did you get into well, that? <laughs> well, I don't know. How do we get into that? We, uh, again, that's another creation of Tara's. I mean, she's a, I don't know, internet guru kind of uh, thing, but she got this really great e-commerce system on the, uh, the AP shop. And uh, we sell an incredible number of baffle boxes, scoreboards, 
precision dice uh, people just and precision dice are difficult to get right now uh sell a lot of clocks but i mean we've probably over the last two or three years we've sold several hundred baffle boxes several hundred scoreboards and thousands of pairs of precision dice so uh, these are my favorite scoreboards i'll tell you i have one of these and i really like them because they're High quality, they're durable, they're compact, and they get the job done. Well, you can see it, some of them where the, like this one here, where the second one is kind of grayed out in certain regards, that's sold out. I mean, a lot of these yeah. things, we just cannot keep them, you know? Yeah. And we were, Tar and I were laughing about that earlier today, and that, uh, you know, we're, fixing to put in an order for some more scoreboards as an example and i was like well what do, what do we need to order you know what and we were going through the you know inventory and what have you and she she laughs though she says it doesn't matter to a lot of these people if we don't have what they want they'll buy something else <laughs> you know so just they'll buy whatever we might have so uh, that's been a lot of fun and it, it's a very uh i don't know state-of-the-art kind of e-commerce type system and you know what's also neat and we talked about earlier the ace point tournaments that we run uh again one that she developed that's a totally automated uh tournament system so you know you sign up to play in a tournament like this weekend's tournament you get in you know you get an automatic bracket you get notified of who you play you play your match you know you enter that you won then it boom, it automatically tells you who you play next. And I mean, it's all automated with uh, emails and texts and so forth. So it's really a user-friendly or player-friendly, in this case, um, system. And uh, people people just love it. The, the ones that use it, they love it. And uh, so anyway, we're, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, and you made me, do a little introspection. I know on your list there, you were talking about, you know, other, other hobbies, other interests, and it's that yeah. and the other. I mean, as you can tell, I mean, between all the commentary and streaming that we do, and we were out of the country like six or seven weeks this year, and then, yeah. you know, several tournaments here in the States, but between the streaming and commentary, the, uh, the Texas tournament, the AP shop, the online tournaments, um, it never ends. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I play online a fair amount. Tara does much less, but, um, uh, you know, it's backgammon's our lives and, uh, we're loving it, you know? Well, you, you're both outstanding ambassadors to the game really enjoy uh, all of your work and appreciate all of your efforts. It's uh, really, really, you know, and, and another thing, Alex, I'm sorry to interrupt. Another thing that, that I really enjoy doing, you know, we talked about earlier the commentary and the guest commentators and how, how we have a, try to keep it a balanced, you know, broadcast so that it is attractive to people across all skill level spectrums and ages and this, that, and the other, you know, it's humorous. It's, it's technical to a degree. It describes what's going on, but another thing, and, and people just love this. And I know you take advantage of this quite a bit is I love to make the commentary an interactive sort of deal. So when I'm doing commentary, uh, I have a, laptop or an ipad or something open right in front of me so i can read the chat line and people ask questions or make comments and um uh, you know i can immediately respond or mention somebody's name and really say and people just love that and Absolutely. it brings them it brings them into the game and it's um uh, it's kind of like virtually being at the tournament you know very and, interactive and it's it's a very unique what you do all the innovations that the two of you have come up with are just outstanding. And you're always coming up with new things. Well, <laughs> we have to try to stay ahead of the curve. They're always, uh, you know, there's someone always right behind you. So, uh, yeah. well, great. It's been, it's been really wonderful hearing 
all your stories uh, before we conclude. Are there any any other things you want to tell our viewers, words of wisdom or things you've learned or enjoyed? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, you know, and I, I heard you and others talking about this recently, you know, browsing some of your interviews and whatever, but, and in our own experience, I mean, if you enjoy the game, it's a, it's a great backgammon community out there. And to the extent that, you know, anyone can travel domestically, international, whatever support tournaments, it's an amazing experience. And, uh, I mean, we, again, we're fortunate and, you know, getting to go to these various places, uh, Trier and Istanbul, Monte Carlo, Dubai, Cyprus, and, uh, you know, oftentimes we're working, uh, so we're subsidized to a degree. We're not getting wealthy doing it, I'll assure you. But, you know, we combine those travels typically with maybe we go a few days early, stay a few days later, um, you know, go somewhere else in Europe or whatever to uh, just see the world. And And there's almost no place we can go now, particularly, where we don't know someone, right? So you can, uh, you can meet friends or you can have, uh, you can uh, have, uh, you know, get recommendations of where to go eat or where to, what to see, what to do. And it, it's just, I mean, we're living the high life of backgammon right now. So yeah, quite the community. Well, great. Um, okay, well, thank you. Thank you so very much, Bill. I really appreciate your time. It's been very enjoyable, you and Tara as well. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, many people who know me, they know that I'm very approachable. So if anybody having watched this, they have questions of me, um, whatever, uh, you know, Bill Riles at sbcglobal.net or 281-703-9304. Call I'll me, send that, me an email. I'll put that in the description. If you want to just send it to me on a message, I'll, I'll include that in the description. Um, okay. What a beautiful den you have. I can see the Texas backgammon championships always on Super Bowl weekend, right? Always on Super Bowl weekend. And, uh, you know, we have a big Super Bowl party in the director's suites upstairs on the top floor on Sunday evening. And, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I, I always tell people, you know, if you haven't been there before, I will guarantee you that you will have a good time in San Antonio. Yeah, and that's uh, what everyone says. So anyway, we, uh, we look forward to it Yeah, and hope great. to see, uh, see all of y'all there. Yes. Yes. I definitely recommend it. Uh, I haven't been to the tournament. I've been to San Antonio once, but I haven't been to the tournament, but everyone I know that's been to that tournament tells me so many wonderful things. So can't recommend it highly enough. I really appreciate your time in this video and hopefully um, I can have you on. We can do some more videos uh, later or anything else. Well, do that. And, uh, you know, certainly one of these days we'll cross paths at a tournament and perhaps uh, I can get you into the uh, guest commentator's chair as well. It, oh, I love that. I love that. I appreciate it. I think it. you would have fun with that. So. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again so much. I want to thank the viewers for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was certainly enjoyable for me. Please like and subscribe and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. Again, my book, Backgammon Backgame Strategies, is now available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. If you are interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email will be in the description. I look forward to seeing you in future videos. And until then, keep rolling your dice.